Hello everyone, I'm Paul Ralph, Professor of Software Engineering at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada, and thank you for coming to this keynote address at the EASE 2021 Doctoral Symposium. Today we're going to talk about what makes an academic community constructive, welcoming and joyful, or destructive, exclusionary and toxic. We're going to talk about how we get from where we are now to the kind of community most of us want. We're going to start with a little utopian fiction and move on to concrete strategy. Here we go. The year is 2040. The last coal-fired power plant in Europe has just closed. Americans drive electric cars. The PlayStation 9 has just come out. Software development is the most popular undergraduate major in the world. Meet Zen. Born in Quebec City in 2015, she begins a post-bachelor PhD program in the Faculty of Computer Science at the University of Nova Scotia formerly Dalhousie University, until we gave up naming stuff after people. Zen's interested in how virtual reality IDEs affect the dynamics of software teams. She'll be supervised by Prof Balance. In her first semester, Zen takes three PhD level courses, a core research methods course taken by all computer science PhD students, a statistics course, and a seminar course related to her research area. In her second semester, she takes advanced qualitative and quantitative methods courses and a directed readings course with Prof Hardy, an expert in virtual reality programming at McGill University. By May, Zen has finished her courses and it's time to do her summer project. This is her first real experience with empirical research and she has to submit it before she can take her comprehensive exam. Following up on her directed readings course, Zen and Profs Ballas and Hardy decide to collaborate on a systematic literature review on virtual reality IDEs. The first step is to review the journal's acceptance criteria for systematic literature reviews. You see, explains Prof Ballas, the journal tells us exactly what they expect. Zen makes a face. What if their expectations are unreasonable, she asks. Well, then we change it, explains Prof Ballas. See this description of what should be in the replication package? I wrote that. Everyone in our community can suggest changes to these criteria. Sometimes there are pretty intense arguments about them, but they're good arguments. It's all out in public where everyone gets to weigh in and we can build consensus or at least vote. Back in the day, we had the same arguments over and over again, privately, anonymously, in the context of individual manuscripts where reviewers and authors had unequal power. Four months later, Zen and Prof Ballas meet to put the final touches on the paper. They pull up the journal's pre-submission checklist and their paper side by side. They read the paper together, checking off items one by one. They're not just checking that the paper has all the essential attributes. They're making sure that reviewers can easily see each attribute. Then they submit the paper. As part of the submission process, Zen indicates that the method used is systematic literature review. The submission system checks for grammatical problems, problems with figures and tables like tiny fonts, the completeness of references, and compliance with the template. Zen also has a chance to fix any identified errors so reviewers won't complain about them later. Next, the paper goes through automated plagiarism detection and a classifier that identifies the research methods used. The paper, plagiarism report, and classification results go to one of several managing editors the ME checks that the paper is within the venue scope, checks the plagiarism report, and verifies that the method selected by the author matches the method chosen by the classifier. Next, the paper goes to paper bidding, and a preprint is automatically deposited on archive. Every second month, the paper board bids for papers, like in many conferences today. The system assigns two reviewers, one reconciler, and one judge. I'll define these in a minute. Reviewer 1 opens the paper and the review form side by side. The review form is structurally identical to the pre-submission checklist used by the authors. The reviewer reads through the paper, checking off each attribute. Since reviewers and authors have the same list, the authors have made it very easy to see each attribute and usually present things in the same order as the checklist. The acceptance criteria are organized into three categories, essential, desirable, and extraordinary. Only the essential criteria are used to determine whether the paper is accepted, but the reviewers also select from a list of any desirable or extraordinary features of the work. 
A desirable attribute might be something like including a Prisma flow diagram. An extraordinary attribute might be having two researchers independently undertaking the preliminary search process before finalizing the search scope and keywords. Desirable and extraordinary attributes determine a paper's grade, which I'll come back to later. When reviewer one reads the limitations section, they feel that the paper doesn't sufficiently acknowledge the potential for publication bias. They indicate that the deviation isn't reasonable and that it's a type one error, meaning that the, this, the kind of problem that can be fixed by editing text versus an error that requires new data analysis, new data collection, or something that just isn't fixable. They explain that the limitations section should better acknowledge publication bias. The reviewer does not write an essay. The reviewer does not compare the paper's strengths and weaknesses. The reviewer does not recommend the decision. The reviewer just checks whether the paper matches the journal's acceptance criteria for this kind of study. When the two review reviews are submitted, the system checks for agreement. All attributes on which reviewers agree are considered resolved. The reviewers agree most of the time because the authors highlight required attributes and the clarity of the attributes has been incrementally refined for two decades using analysis of inter-reviewer agreement across thousands of papers to identify problematic attributes. Enter the reconciler. The reconciler receives the paper and the list of disagreements between reviewers one and two. The reconciler's job is to resolve the disagreements. The reconciler can read the paper, talk to the reviewers, or talk to the authors. But one way or another, all disagreements must be resolved. If the reviewers can't agree, the reconciler makes the call. The reconciler does not write an essay or meta review, does not introduce new criticism, and does not recommend a decision. The reconciler just resolves disagreements. When all the disagreements have been resolved, the journal's decision rules determine the outcome. Like the journal's acceptance criteria, its rules are public, set by the board, and evolve over time. As soon as the editor resolves the disagreements, the system computes the decision and sends the compiled review, that's review, singular, to the authors. There's no manual step where the editor-in-chief or anyone else processes the reviews or writes a decision letter, it's all just automatic. The authors do not receive three ambiguous and conflicting essays about their paper. They receive one structured review with brief reviewer comments organized by acceptance criterion. This review cannot contain contradictions because the reconciler had to resolve all of the contradictions. Reviewers cannot invent unreasonable or incorrect criteria because the reviewers don't make the criteria. Reviewers can still make unreasonable criticisms in their general comments but those comments neither affect the decision nor the outcome of any revisions. The authors address their to-dos. The authors do not prepare pages of response to reviewers. When they submit the revision, the system asks how each to-do item was addressed and generates a file highlighting the differences between the original and revised manuscripts. The authors do not respond to the reviewer's general comments. Critically, the paper does not return to the original reviewers or reconciler. The original review team's experience with the paper makes it impossible for them to consider the author's response dispassionately. If the review team is wrong about something, the author should stand their ground and explain why, rather than introduce errors in the paper. Many reviewers get offended at the slightest hint of pushback, so they can't be involved in the revision. The paper goes to someone new, the judge who has not seen the paper or reviews before. The judge doesn't scrutinize the whole paper. The judge looks at the to-do list, the author's responses, and the changes in the paper, and decides whether the to-do items have been addressed. The process is not about making the reviewers happy. It is about meeting the journal's acceptance criteria. In most cases, the judge will accept the paper. Rarely, the judge will ask for another revision. See, in one phase review, like we have at most conferences, reviewers have too little power to compel necessary changes. While in two phase review, like at most journals, authors have too little power to push back against unreasonable criticism and requests. This is 1.5 phase review. It balances the power so neither side can abuse the system. 
The review team is the prosecution. The author team is the defense. Asking either the prosecution or the defense to make the decision is dumb. That's why we need an impartial judge. And we use the system's affordances and signifiers to encourage that impartiality. Once a paper is accepted, it is published immediately. There's no backlog. There's no article processing fees. When the judge clicks the big blue accept button, the paper is automatically assigned to DOI, the system fills in the copyright block, and moments later, the paper is published. The idea is that, rather than inferring paper quality from publication venue, we have a single publication venue that accepts all methodologically valid research and grades each paper based on its desirable and extraordinary attributes. It isn't a competition. There's no limit on the number of papers that can be accepted. We published everything that isn't fundamentally wrong. Furthermore, like Peer J, there's no assessment of interestingness. Asking reviewers about a paper's interestingness or relevance is basically asking them to predict the future. Reviewers are not oracles. They cannot reliably predict which studies will have a big impact, and we shouldn't be making decisions based on patently unreliable judgments. If you want to assess relevance, you have to wait 10 years and see what happens. The next step, if the authors want, is to present the paper at a conference. And here, interestingness does come into play. Instead of a bunch of conferences that all have essentially the same scope, but rove all over the world, we need regional conferences where we can travel a shorter distance to meet people we're more likely to work with. Each year, we can have one international conference that displaces one of the regional conferences. For example, if the international conference is in Peru in 2042, the South American conference doesn't run that year. Back to our story, Prof. Ballas congratulates Zen on their paper acceptance and asks if she wants to go to the North American Software Engineering Conference this year. Naturally, she does, so she registers. Everyone who wants to present or have a say in the conference program has to register by the early bird deadline, around two months before the conference starts. Then it's time to vote. Each attendee gets 20 votes and a list of all the papers, already accepted in the journal, that authors want to present at the conference. You can vote once for 20 different papers or 20 times for one paper or anything in between. When the voting is done, the program chairs use the votes to determine the program. The more votes a paper gets, the more time the authors get to present and the bigger the room it's in. Most papers get 10, 15, or 20 minutes. The most popular papers make up the plenary sessions. The least popular are presented as posters. Nothing is rejected because everything was already quality checked by the journal. During the conference, attendees vote for members of the steering committee. Any attendee can run for a five-year term, and the conference includes a meet the candidate session. The steering committee vets and selects the chairs rather than being present in future chairs. Now it's not 2041, it's 2021. Peer review is catastrophically ineffective and inefficient. For-profit publishers and pseudo-nonprofits control our journals, while mostly benevolent but unelected, basically unaccountable old boy networks control our conferences. To get from this mess to the far better system I've just described, we need a strategy. So here is the strategy. It has four prongs, standardize, automate, emancipate, and combine. The four prongs aren't steps, they're all interconnected, they're all going to happen together. First, we standardize. We fix the review process by defining specific acceptance criteria for each common methodology, building equivalent pre-submission and review checklists, and implementing a more structured review process at our journals and conferences. This probably sounds really difficult, but we've already created standards for a dozen common methodologies. We've prototyped the checklists, and several pilot studies are in the works. You can read all about the standards and try the checklist on the website shown. The next step is to accept that despite being nonprofits, the ACM and the IEEE act just like commercial publishers, and commercial publishers are running the greatest scam in human history. They are never going diamond open access. They're just juggling reader pay models with author pay models to maximize their revenues. It doesn't cost $3,000 to put a PDF on a website. IEEE and ACM don't sponsor our conferences. Sponsors give you money. IEEE and ACM are vampires. They extract money from our conferences to fund their operations. The whole thing's a con. So, 
we hijack our own conferences and journals and liberate them from commercial influence. This is somewhat easier than it sounds. Some math communities are way ahead of us on this one. You see, an academic journal is its board. If the editorial board of, say, empirical software engineering resigns en masse and just starts a new diamond open access journal with approximately the same name, mission accomplished. Furthermore, there's no need for fees at all. A large academic journal can be run entirely from a small grant. If money is involved, the first people who should get paid are the reviewers. We hijack our conferences the same way. The steering committee and program committees are the conference. If the committees walk out and start a new conference with the same name, job done. Meanwhile, we must change the way these steering committees and boards operate. Right now, the committees effectively appoint their own members, meet in secret, and obfuscate their decision making. This is the very definition of nepotism. The steering committees should be elected, their meetings should be broadcast, and their votes should be public. That doesn't mean we have to vote for general and program chairs, that they can be appointed by the committee as long as the committee itself is elected. Similarly, a journal should be run by an editorial committee rather than a single editor-in-chief, and that committee should be elected. Call me an optimist, but I think we just need to raise the right issues, create a little momentum, and the steering committees will voluntarily change their own structures. These people are not evil. Well, a couple of them might be. But for the most part, they're good, dedicated people. They're just busy, not experts in governance, and, and maybe a little scared of big changes. Next, we combine. The only reason we need lots of publication venues is because peer review is random, so we have to keep sending each paper to different venues until it gets accepted somewhere. Once we standardize and structure the review process, all valid research will be published on the first go, so multiple journals are unnecessary. So we combine all the boards together to create our new mega journal. Because of the stupid way metrics are calculated, our new mega journal will demolish any remaining commercial journals. And why would you send a paper to a commercial journal with a mostly random review process and a $3,000 open access fee when you could send it to a journal with a mostly predictable review process, no fees, and a higher impact factor? The last step is to automate. Automate as much of the journal's publication pipeline as possible. Bidding, reviewer assignment, grammar and spelling, template compliance, reference completeness, notifications, reminders, even most of the writing of reviews can be automated. We need simple, single column templates that are easy to comply with and make compliance easy to verify algorithmically. For example, if authors try to submit a figure with two-point text, the system should catch that before the paper is ever assigned to a, review a reviewer. Existing systems like Editorial Manager have heaps of manual steps. We need to treat publishing like continuous delivery, minimizing manual steps, and obviously, once a paper gets final approval, there should be no more manual intervention. The paper should just appear on the website seconds later. Of all the academic communities in the world, we, the software engineering community, are the most capable of doing this. In thinking about these issues, Remember, the point of all this is people. The scientists of tomorrow should not have to suffer the demoralizing, career-destroying, capricious rejection that pervades science today. We are locked in a vicious cycle of abusing each other, but we can break that cycle. No, we are breaking that cycle by building a better system. And it is the system. When faced with rejection, when you start wondering if you're really cut out for a career in research, stop. It's not you, it's the system. We have collectively created a scientific dystopia where we constantly abuse each other because we've conflated high standards with low acceptance rates. But it doesn't have to be that way. Stop writing off every problem as bad old reviewer two, or the associate editor not doing their job, or why aren't the program chairs checking the quality of these reviews? You, you just, you can't just tell people Oh, you're supposed to be an impartial judge, or you're supposed to check whether that the reviews are high quality. The system isn't set up that way. If we redesign the system, the exact same people will produce much better results. And there's stuff you can do to help right now. You can use the checklist to prepare and review manuscripts. 
lots of people using, are using them is the best way to get venues to formally adopt them. You can suggest improvements to the standards on our GitHub repo. The acceptance criteria are good, but need further refinement. They need more eyeballs, more varied perspectives, more scrutiny. And if you want to help prototype better reviewing and publishing systems, you can contact me directly to volunteer. Meanwhile, every chance you get, ask about emancipating our journals and conferences from commercial publishing. Ask if the steering committees will broadcast their meetings. Demand the right to vote for steering committees and editors-in-chief. Just keep bringing it up at every conference town hall, every PC meeting, every editorial board meeting. Ask people publicly on Twitter and privately via email. Write it on those conference feedback forms. We have to shift the Overton window and make taking back our journals and conferences seem like the most obvious thing in the world. And ask for data. Every conference has data we can use to assess the level of agreement between reviewers and the effectiveness of variations like author rebuttals, but they don't release it. I suspect that the picture painted by that data is so shockingly bad that the program chairs won't release it for fear of undermining faith in the conference review process. But hiding data to conceal our own failures is not acceptable for a scientific community. That data needs to be de-identified and published so we can all make evidence-based decisions. And this project needs a leader. I can't do this all myself. Someone needs to step up, figure out the details, and get this emancipation train moving. And that's my talk. Thank you for listening.